Happy. Hi. Hi. We're discussing whether you should read Dickens or not. Say unmute and say hi. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hello. 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 The we've, got the right guy, we've got the right guy to talk about him today. We've got Henry Elliott. Uh, don't worry, if you're scared of Dickens, you will be no longer scared after the end of this uh, session. Um, we're really excited because we've filmed, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but we filmed a little time course, the first of three parts with Henry, um, which we launched a couple of days ago. And um, you're just going to get a taste this evening of um, his enthusiasm. So. Um, we're looking forward to that in a few minutes and Tom will introduce Henry properly in a minute but for anybody who's new I'm just going to um, uh, remind tell you what's going on this is the Idler I'm Victoria I run the Idler Academy which is live events and online courses we've got the editor of the Idler magazine here Tom Hodgkinson who will be in conversation with Henry Elliott Henry is a writer and he describes himself as a writer and a walker because he leads interesting curated walks all over the place, but a lot in London. Um, we've got Mark Vernon, um, philosopher, author and intelligent extraordinaire um, who comes every week and gives us his wisdom. Um, I was just so confessing gonna... that I've never read a a novel of Charles Dickens, so <laughs> I take myself down quite a few steps. Let's Unbelievable. Well, I, I, I really, really started reading them in lockdown because they're, they're actually terrifying, I think. They're, they're so long, for one thing, most of them. Okay, well, I'm going to go straight, let's go straight over to you, Mark. And if everybody would mute themselves now, apart from Mark, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Very lovely to be back again and having just admitted that I haven't read anything on Charles Dickens I'm looking forward to being educated about that this evening and henceforth but I wondered about trying to say something about another or near Victorian figure at least um, and I hope this might kind of complement what Henry and Tom say um, but also speak to something of what I'm feeling right this now this week um, and that's to think about the figure of William James so William James, the great American well, philosopher and psychologist, but sometimes called the, fa the father of modern psychology. Um, he was a great coiner of phrases and words himself. He was actually quite a big literary figure. Um, so stream of consciousness is one of his best known phrases, for example. Um, he was the brother of Henry James, the novelist. And sometimes people say that William James was the psychologist who should have been a novelist and Henry James was the novelist who should have been the psychologist. Um, very, very readable figure, William James. So do pick up something by him. Why might he be useful for now, as well as somehow complimenting Dickens, is because he's very much associated with the school of philosophy known as pragmatism. And pragmatism feels like it must have something useful for an R now. Um, you know, the quick way of summarizing it would be what works um, and going with what works. Um, and so having a pragmatic attitude feels useful for now. Um, when everything's changing so much, even you know, day by day, and the future feels so uncertain. Um, his pragmatism has kind of at least two levels of advice, you might say, or wisdom. Um, one is that the people see the world differently. You know, um, a pragmatic worldview is a plural worldview because people's lives work in different ways. And he says quite clearly that people see the world in different ways. And one of his essays is called On a Certain Blindness in Human Beings. And the blindness is that we forget that people see the world in different ways. And when we forget that, it's what causes tension. Um, a line from the essay is, neither the whole of truth nor the whole of good is revealed to any single observer, although each observer gains a partial superiority of insight from the peculiar position in which they stand. So he's saying that we have our own take on things and in a way our own take is particular and special and unique that has a kind of value, a superiority in itself. But at the same time, we mustn't forget that other people too have that particular perspective and, and superior vision. And I think one of the things perhaps that a genius novelist is able to do is to make you realize that 
at least the main characters have their own distinctive and unique viewpoint and they try and produce that into a kind of harmonious whole so that you can uh, respect many superior visions as it were and not just um, one over another. Um, another insight which William James has that spoke to me now is um, he thought that human beings can be divided into two types you know that you can play this game dividing humanity into two types you know those who like marmites and those who don't like marmites whatever it might be but he thought that there are what you call what he called sick souls and healthy souls and um healthy souls are people for who the world basically seems fine actually you know sometimes the clouds obscure the sun but you always know the sun's going to come back out again probably today if not tomorrow and um, whereas sick souls for james are people who for whom life is a struggle um, it's going to be difficult. It's going to feel anxious. It's going to feel like really the base is things going wrong rather than things going well. And again, he thought that we need these two complements in our humanity because the healthy soul keeps us going. It keeps um, having hope. But the sick soul, because they wrestle with things, also question things. And so they're able to produce depth in life. Um, so again, it was a way of thinking about how, you know, sometimes you feel like there's one side in this whole COVID situation that is sort of fairly optimistic. We must be able to get on with our lives, uh, not have them too intruded upon and so on. But then there's the other side that's really worried um, and so wants things to be more contained and controlled. Well, it's not straightforward. None of this is straightforward, but William James would actually say, you know, we need both the sick soul and the healthy soul um, to keep going in life, but also to discover more and more in life. And, the third point, final point I just wanted to make um, was that the more and more in life was what William James was very much about. He felt this is key to what it is to be human. I think you know, it's why we enjoy novels. It's why we um, have a spiritual and religious side. It's why we have the scientific quest. And we want to push to what James just actually called the more. Um, but the twist he gives it as a pragmatist um, is that the truth is found in the quest itself. Um, it's not, as it were, that suddenly it gets downloaded as if you're some sort of robot or artificial intelligence. It's the questing itself that really matters. Um, it's when you realise that you haven't grasped something, that someone else is different, and that you know, your sick soul is getting you that day rather than the healthy side of things that might have been sustaining you yesterday. Um, it's in that tension and embracing that tension as a pragmatist um, that he really developed his philosophy and psychology. You can perhaps see how the two things come together. Um, and as um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, another philosopher um, who often parroted uh, William James, um, he put it like this in one of his books. Um, he said, the unutterable will be unutterably contained in what has been uttered. Um, the unutterable will be unutterably contained in what has been uttered. And I think the point is that great writing, great literature, whilst it clearly is limited in a way, you know, a novel is contained within the covers of a book, nonetheless, it takes on this immortal quality because it feels like it's saying more than the words within the pages in one literal sense say. Um, and so this is to begin to hand over to Tom and Henry, because I wonder whether one of the reasons why Charles Dickens is one of those authors for whom the word immortal seems to come quite naturally is because they both pay attention to experience. They're really interested in the differences between people, how some have sick and health, others have healthy souls. And yet they use their imagination to be able to bring that together so that we feel that more and more of life is being channeled to us, even as we listen to the tensions and the difficulties as well as the triumphs and happinesses in the stories themselves. Now I say that not having read any Charles Dickens, but I wonder whether that makes any sense to you. Well, not having read Charles Dickens, I think that makes a lot of sense. And um, it's actually a, a brilliant expression of what is so attractive about Dickens, really, isn't it, Henry? It's, it's that sort of exuberance and this huge collection of um, brilliant characters who, who are both sick and healthy it, it, to their extreme. Uh, and I think as we'll find out, you know, what Dickens does is, Creates, you wouldn't call them caricatures, but they're certainly sort of exaggerated versions of uh, people that he met in everyday life. And a lot of these people were based on people he knew. Now, let's, let me introduce um, the brilliant young uh, scholar, editor and writer, 
Henry Elliott, who joins us from his shoppes uh, in London. If you don't know what a shoppes is, it's a, a neologism combining the word shed with the word office. Now clearly there's been a, you know, sort of a rise in interest in shop uh under lockdown. Or if you're a reader of the FT How to Spend It section, which is where the Financial Times tells its uh, millionaire readers what to do with their money because they, they can't, they don't have enough time to, uh, <laughs> uh, this, they don't have enough time to kind of conjure up what to do with it. So they have to uh, read these guides. Um, they, they, they have renamed the shed uh, an architect designed garden space. So that's what you got there, Henry, is an architect designed garden yeah, that's space. That's what I'm modeling now. Um, <laughs> I'm, back, I'm quite excited to be in this shop, is actually, because this is only the second day of me having moved into it. It's very, very new. And oh, that's I, won't, um, I won't show you on camera, but I was telling you earlier, but it doesn't actually have internet yet. To get on this Zoom call, I've had to cobbled together a whole string of ethernet cables through our garden and it's there's a real Heath Robinson effect going on just off camera but so you'll have to imagine that. Now, what about Dickens? Did he have a, a writing? Well yes let, let me ask that yes, question yes, quickly. Yes, you know, how, how did he what we're going to talk about is, is how he sort of did this and um uh, yeah. well but, let's but, start with that but then let's go back to a sort of a, 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 a bit of a sort of um you know, early history. Okay, well, yeah, just on the shop, I mean, Dickens was a bit of a pioneer of the shoppers because um, in his uh, um, house in, in Kent at Gads Hill, just near uh, Rochester, he had built this um, extraordinary Swiss chalet in his garden. It's a most bizarre building, and it actually still exists. If you go to Rochester, it's just, it's a bit sort of hidden away around a corner um, in a little public park, but it's still there. Dickens is writing chalet, but he used it in the last years of his life. And he created, um, I guess he created this because he wants to get away from his um, absolutely massive family. Because I think <laughs> yes. yeah, over the sort of 20 years he was married, um, uh, he was writing, as we know, from the age of 18, 19. Uh, Pickwick Papers was massive. He was 21. He died at 56 or 57, I think. Um, and he had 10 children, didn't he, when he was, and, and uh, multiple servants and uh, various hangers on. Yeah. I mean, how, how did he get all this work done? Well, that is the extraordinary thing about Dickens, is just how energetic he was. It, it, you know, it's, it's very hard to understand how he crammed all this stuff into his life, because as well as writing 15 enormous and absolutely best-selling novels, he was also writing a huge amount of other stuff. He was writing journalism, short stories, uh, petitions, essays. Uh, he was writing and producing, directing and acting in plays quite often. <laughs> And then as well as all that, he was having this family, he was hosting dinners, he was touring the world, reading extracts from his book. He was going for these very long and energetic walks and sort of setting up, you know, there was one moment where he set up a, with Angela Bird at Coots, he set up um, a home for fallen women called the Urania Cottage in Shepherd's Bush. And he didn't just set it up, he, he managed it for 10 years. He wrote all the rules, sort of a little bit admittance, and, you know, it just, it is unbelievable how he fitted so much into his life. And maybe it's unsurprising that he basically sort of worked himself into the grave at the end of his 50s. I mean, he just... I mean, some, so some of the commenters are saying, well, uh, it must have been easy for him because he had lots of, uh, you know, um, servants and um, you know, various women around to do the sort of house care and stuff like that. But that still doesn't really account for this absolutely massively prodigious output, does it? Yeah, I mean, I, of course, he, I'm sure he did have a huge amount of help. And, and one, of the, one of the things at the end of his life was he ran a weekly journal for the last 20 years of his life. Every week one came out. But of course, he did have an assistant editor who was helping him a lot with that. Yeah, I think he did get a lot of help. But, but the, the novels he wrote, you know, that was him on his own at his desk. He would cancel social engagements to get that done. It's just, I do think it's extraordinary how he turned this stuff out. What was his daily routine, if you could remember from, from, from your investigations? Yeah. Well, on, if he was in the middle of writing, he would write during the day and he'd stop by seven. And it was a rare occasion if he'd carry on beyond that. And he'd, um, uh, if he did, he'd, he'd sort of mention it in his letters, how he was behind on an instalment and had to carry on writing. The most, um, <laughs> the most extraordinary period of his life is that very early period, early 20s, when he was writing Pickwick Papers, that was only half finished when he started writing Oliver Twist. 
So he was writing both novels simultaneously. And then while he was still writing Oliver Twist, he started Nicholas Nickleby. And when he was doing that, he would split the month. So he'd, um, he'd spend the first two weeks of the month writing the next installment of Pickwick Papers, then he'd go to Oliver Twist and so on. Um, and I think maybe the, one of the things that helped him was this um, method of publication that he basically invented, this, this method of serial publication, which was one of the secrets of his success, really. Now, let's go back to the first... Pickwick Papers wasn't his first book. It was his first sort of proper novel. I think that was preceded by sketches by Boz. That's right. That's right. Yes, he... he I mean, he began his career as a professional writer, writing uh, one-off pieces for various periodicals around London. And he tended to call those pieces sketches because they were little vignettes, little descriptions of a place, little character sketches of a type of person he'd spotted. And he was placing these, you know, over the whole of the late 30s, basically. And then um, uh, he collected them together into a two-volume book edition, which he called Sketches by Boz. And that was his first book, and it was extremely popular. And it was on the strength of that success that Chapman and Hall invited him to write his first novel, which was The Pickwick Papers. And he was only 21. Let's go back a bit into his childhood, because uh, he had a sort of, you know, Mark Vernon was talking about the sick and the healthy soul. Uh, and it seems that, you know, th these two kinds of soul were combined in Dickens. I mean, on the one hand, he was enormously cheerful and exuberant uh, and a sort of positive person. But he, he had these really terrible childhood experiences, which obviously left him, must have left him with some pretty bad scars. And also perhaps a bit of sympathy for um, people who, who, who'd been dealt a... Um, uh, you know, who'd had bad luck in life. Absolutely, yes. His childhood, his childhood is really odd. It splits very neatly into two totally different sections. So until, until he was 11, he grew up in Chatham uh, on the Kent coast and had basically a pretty idyllic childhood. His father worked um, as a clerk for the um, Navy pay office. And um, he grew up with his sister and brother. He, he was very exuberant, he read lots, he went to school, he, he was a very um, sort of precocious performer from a young age and his father would lift him up and put him on tables in pubs to sing the song that he'd just learned. He was this <laughs> very sort of cheerful little boy, basically. Very talented, very um, sort of extrovert. And then when he was 11, this terrible kind of blow hit the family where um, the father was his job moved back to London, they moved to Camden Town, and his father, who'd always struggled with money, uh, fell into debt, and eventually um, he got put into the Marshalsea Debtors Prison in South London. And this was a total disaster for Dickens, basically. It, it meant that he suddenly wasn't able to live with his family. He went and lodged with a, with a, with a kind of neighbour who he didn't like very much, and he was put to work in this really grim um, shoe polish bottling factory on the Thames uh, near Blackfriars. And his descriptions of that in later life, um, it, it's what he based Fagin's Den on was this uh, factory that he worked in. There was the sound of rats writhing in the cellars and he was stuck into a, um, a little nook. And all he had to do all day was stick labels on bottles of shoe polish and um, put a uh, little screw on the lid and put a cap on. and. Um, I think those two sides of his childhood absolutely stuck with him throughout his life. Um, he, you know, he very specifically refers to them in several novels, like Oliver Twist. David Copperfield um, is a very autobiographical novel, and there's sections just like that. And I think you're right. I think that sort of combat. He was very, also very secretive about this past. He wanted people to think of him as a as a gentleman. He didn't want them to know that he'd had this experience, you know, working in a in a factory, which was very the meaning for him. And so he, um, he kept it very secret, but channeled it into his books. And I think it did give him that affinity with the, the whole spectrum of society. Because one day he'd be meeting Queen Victoria, she'd be saying how much she liked his books, but he would have that memory of, of being there in the, on the wharves at Blackheath. Now, what about uh, the idea of him as a Victorian novelist? Because we think he's a Victorian novelist and you, you look at um, you know, Nicholas Nickleby and Oliver Twist and, and people say Dickens transformed uh, the, you know, 
Victorian conditions of work and, 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 and the workhouse and so on. Yeah. But in actual fact, I mean, Queen Victoria didn't come to the throne till I think, was it 1837? Um, I think that's right, it was halfway through Oliver Twist. She... Halfway through Oliver Twist, so, yeah. so those, you know, when he was 22 or something like that, um, 23. And so those books really were written about late Georgian London. Uh, Absolutely right, be yeah. Before some of these reforms had um, taken place. So a friend of mine says, you know, it's, it, he actually thinks it's a bit unfair on the Victorians <laughs> uh, <laughs> that we should characterise, um, you know, we say Dickensian London. Yes. Um, and that's very much the first part of the 19th century, not the later part, when um, actually partly as, as a result of Dickens' books, the great and the good had introduced, uh, you know, much more liberal policies, shorter working days and banned child labour and so on. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, you're exactly right that, you know, he started writing in Georgian London um, and most of his novels are set in that kind of period you know, that he grew up when he was a young man first living in London. They're mostly set a few years or a couple of decades in the past. There are two novels he wrote which are specifically historical novels. Um, Barnaby Rudge is set in the 1780s and uh, Tale of Two Cities, of course, is set around the um, uh, French Revolution. Um, but all of, the, most of them are set a little bit, uh, you know, a couple of decades before he was writing them, apart from a couple. So one of the... Um, the, the one that's very sort of contemporary is Our Mutual Friend, his last completed novel, which was very um, much a kind of topical satire of these uh, um, various character types that he saw around him at the time. There's one family called the Veneerings, who were everything totally brand new, and uh, they, they're incredibly wealthy, but they've only just got their wealth, so everything's sort of wafer um, thin. Um, and and so that novel, he was consciously thinking, right, I'm going to write about now. But you're right, it, it, he's looking backwards all the time. And something like A Christmas Carol, uh, he's, what he was doing there was channeling the Christmases of his childhood um, from that Chatham period of his life, you know, before he was 11 years old, when it was much colder, there were much snowier Christmases. And that's what he's remembering when he writes something like A Christmas Carol. Is there any philosophy in the books? What's he trying to get across? Or, or, or are they really, you know, picaresque, uh, Hogarthian snapshots, if you like, of um, early Georgian or early, uh, you know, late Georgian or early Victorian London? I mean, did he have any sort of philosophical ideas that he would like to sort of push out there? Well, I'm sure, uh, I, think he, I think he did, I think he was, I mean, when Mark was talking earlier, it made me think that one of the criticisms that are often leveled against Dickens is that he's not very good at psychology. Um, I don't agree with this, but one of the criticisms of him is that he's a very uh, visual uh, surface person. So he'll draw these thinly sketched caricatures uh, and, um, and, and almost presents it like a pantomime, like a theatre stage, and you're seeing these people act out their story, and then um, he wraps it up neatly at the end. I think there's an element of that in the earlier novels, when he was very much looking back to a picaresque 18th century tradition of Tobias Smollett or um, Henry Fielding, where there, there's a kind of central figure who's slightly randomly, someone like Nicholas Nickleby, is slightly randomly wandering around the story, bumping into funny people, having scrapes, and you, mm. there's, definitely, there's a moment in Nicholas Nickleby where you get towards the end and you feel Dickens thinking, okay, I better wrap this up now. And he starts sort of pulling the plot together and, and sort of marshalling it. But I think increasingly um, over the course of his career, he brings in more and more psychology. And if he has a philosophy, I think it's, um, it's a philosophy of kindness. I think he has a kind of view of how he wants, how he feels humans should behave to each other. And particularly in those later novels, he's very... I'm interested in showing all the different connections between every person in this novel. So a novel like Bleak House has got a spectrum from Joe the little road sweeper up to um, Celeste Deadlock at the top, from the aristocracy to the lowest of the low. Huge number of characters in between, but that book is all about how the um, connections come, there's all these secret, hidden, invisible connections between all the people in that novel. And I think that was, I think that was something that Dickens felt very strongly. Yeah, this, this kind of uh, philosophy of, of 
how we should behave and kind of a kindness. What about Mark Chapley? He's such a lovely character and, and he sort of em embodies stoicism taken to an extreme, yes. doesn't he, in Martin Chuzzlewit? Yes, that's true. So <laughs> Martin Chuzzlewit wasn't selling very well. It was one of the first books that wasn't an immediate success. And so Dickens um, was sort of thinking, what could he do? And decided to send Martin, the main character, to America, where Dickens had actually just visited himself. And he thought, this will bring in the crowds because I can do some hilarious stuff about how terrible America is. And there's this whole sort of section, which is pretty brilliant, but it's, it's kind of just plopped in the middle of that novel, where Martin, with Mark Tapley, goes to America and has a terrible time. It just gets worse and worse and worse, and poor Mark Tapley kind of sticks with him all the way through, and is this sort of amazing voice of optimism all the way through. He's always sort of seeing some, you know, things are going to turn out for the best. They go to a place, they buy a little plot in a place called Eden, which sounds nice and turns out to be um, this horrific malarial swamp in the backwaters of <laughs> New York State. <laughs> and they almost die. Um, before. Apparently there's a story that um, Americans were absolutely furious with Martin Chuzzlewit. And there's a story about um, an Englishman reading Martin Chuzzlewit on the boat across to New York and jumping overboard in, rather than land in this terrible country. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he 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 does he, he attacks the Americans um, in quite a funny way. And I mean, uh, there was this piece by A. N. Wilson that said, "Oh, Dickens was a racist because he didn't uh, attack a um, an English governor of the West Indies who'd uh, really very brutally put down the slave revolt and, and killed hundreds and thousands of people, or at least hundreds." And there were Quakers and good and the great and the good in Victorian London were calling for him to be arrested for murder or tried for murder. And Dickens um, uh, didn't join this chorus, and so Anne Wilson has said, "Well, that that was pretty bad." But actually, also, it, you know, on the other hand, in Martin Chuzzlewit, he does say, you know, this was a, this is a sort of land of, uh, you know, it's built on slavery, which, which which constantly talks about freedom. And he yeah. said they they talk about freedom while holding a gun to your head. You know, this is the land of the free. Um, and they're all, they're all armed and they're violent. <laughs> but that was his observation. Like, like, that seemed to be sort of pretty humane. Yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's a attention grabbing headline, but I think it's a bit unfair because, uh, it, well, especially in Martin Chuzzlewit and in, in, in the travel book he wrote about going to America called American Notes for General Circulation. He's, he's absolutely outspoken about how horrific slavery looks to him when he's out there. And, you know, I'm sure Dickens is not a perfect person at all, and I'm sure we'll get on to talking about his wife and, and the affairs he had and so on. But I think he was willing to uh, change, especially when things were pointed out to him. So, for instance, um, uh, one, he's been criticised for his anti-Semitism in the portrait of Fagin in Oliver Twist. And he was criticised at the time. And it's interesting that in the first half of that book, he described, he, when he refers to Fagin, he calls him the Jew. And he does that almost 300 times, I think, in the first half of the book. And then he had a letter complaining from an acquaintance, a Jewish acquaintance of his saying, you know, this is really unfair. Why are you doing, singling this man's religion out? And at that, from that point, he changed the references to Fagin um, and then went back and revised the rest of the book. And in fact, still felt he hadn't paid back that um, debt. And in Our Mutual Friend, intentionally brings in a very sympathetic, good Jewish moneylender character as a kind of, uh, I don't know, as a kind of antidote. So I think, yeah, I think it's unfair to call him racist. And I, who knows what his personal reasons for not weighing in on that specific debate were. And what about his relationships with women? Because uh, yeah. the objections we hear, one, his portraits of women in the books are a little sort of sentimental or idealised. Um, as we mentioned earlier, he had 10 children with uh, Catherine Hogarth. Uh, her sister, Mary, who he loved, died when she was only 17, I think, and Dickens was probably in his early 20s. Um, so, so poor old Catherine had to put up with like, being this sort of brood mare for 20 years and producing 10 children. Um, maybe if life wasn't so bad, I mean, they obviously, they were really well off. I mean, he was making loads of money all the way through and he just makes, he made more and more and more, a million, you know, the equivalent of millions and millions and millions today. Um, but after 20 years, he suddenly said, oh, I don't like you anymore. And just suddenly cut her off completely and never saw her again. Um, and developed this sort of uh, infatuation with 
young Ellie Turner and, had, and sort yeah. of ended up looking after her family. It's really quite odd. It's really odd, yes. And I think that, you know, this is the, if you, if there's something to criticise Dickens for, it's his, it's his view of women, I believe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but the splitting with his wife is pretty shocking. He, he was complaining about her in letters to friends saying, oh, she's a bit fat and exhausted now. And, you know, <laughs> poor thing had just given birth to a string of 10 children. And yeah, it was really dramatic, their split. I mean, he, he moved out of their, you know, the family, his bedroom, his the marriage room. He moved into his dressing room next door and blocked up the doorway. And he built a bookshelf in the doorway so that he kind of built this wall between him and his wife. And um, eventually they did separate. It seems like they separated amicably initially and then something happened and no one quite knows what, but it may be a, there was something about a piece of jewellery that he bought for his mistress, Ellen Turnan. And, um, and then they never spoke again in their lives. They never met again. They, I think they exchanged maybe three letters over the last 15, 20 years of his life. And this, um, you know, it's, it feels so uh, sort of, cliche the way he fell in love with Ellen Turnan and Nellie Turnan. It was some, um, he, uh, his friend Wilkie Collins had written a play called The Frozen Deep and Dickens was starring in this play and was helping to cast it and for the, it was all gentlemen amateurs playing the male parts and then they got um, professional female actresses to play the women parts and Dickens was in his 40s I think, Ellen Turnan was I think 18 or something when he met her. He fell desperately in love with her and um, sort of engineered these writing trips with Wilkie Collins around the country so he could follow her in plays around. He went and met her in Doncaster because she was in a play there. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story because Dickens was so good at hiding it. And for a long time, none of this was known. And some of it came out um, after his death. Uh, but then it was really Claire Tomlin and her book, The Invisible Woman, who, who unearthed, did a load of research and unearthed a lot of this stuff. And it seems like they had this um, like relationship for the last um, 13 or 14 years of his life. And he, he put her up in Peckham Rye. And um, uh, one of the times he was closest to becoming to sort of publicly exposed in this affair was when he was involved in a, in a very serious train accident on the way back from Paris. They were coming up from Dover to London and the train uh, with Dickens in it with Ellen Turner and her mother went over over a viaduct and almost all the carriages went off and everyone died. Dickens was the last first class carriage that wasn't actually off the tracks. And he he survived, they all survived, but it really shook him and um, he, he'd almost lost part of his manuscript of our mutual friend on the train. And he, he didn't refuse to be a witness at the sort of inquiry afterwards because it might come out that he was traveling with this mistress. He also so he, gets, he, he not a, he is not doesn't treat he didn't treat women well and um and you're right the female characters in his books there are some amazing ones and very sort of strong-willed characters i'm thinking of um edith in dombey and son this is amazing very powerful sort of feminist character um and some sort of absolutely memorable female characters like miss havisham but but he has a line in these slightly creepy um sort of child wife um kind of 15, 16 year old angelic young girls. And it, that hasn't aged so well, that element of the book. No, and then I, I think psychologically, some of the biographers think it was something to do with this Mary Hogarth who died when she was 17. And this possibly, sort, yeah. sort, of, sort of bright star in the household uh, who we like. He did of course publish a lot of female writers at the time, people like Mary Gaskell in his weekly magazines and things. So, you know, he was, he was supporting the um, uh, professional women of his acquaintance. That's true. Yes, yes. Elizabeth Gaskell, yes, was um, Gaskell, yeah. lined up, you know, was a regular contributor to Household Words. Um, yes, I, the thing about Dickens is he's full of contradictions. And I think his public persona was very different to his private persona. And, um, you know, he'd, he'd lay on these lavish meals for his friends where he'd order the very best champagne and get him these extraordinary dishes from the local restaurants. But when he was eating at home on his own, he'd eat very parsimoniously and, and sort of um, I wouldn't drink at all. So I think he had this kind of, these many different sides to him. And in fact, he even, it's interesting how madness comes up a lot in his books. There are 
some people like Mr. Dick and David Copperfield who really do seem quite kind of um, loopy, but he's very keen to um, show how, whatever your state of mind, you're able to contribute to society. And I think he felt there was something wrong inside his head too. This ability to um, perform all these different characters, to write all these different characters. He would, um, to write his characters, he would often stand in front of the mirror and just become the character and speak and sort of almost channel what they were saying, write it down. And I think he was sometimes worried that this ability to switch personalities in his head was, was, um, was a kind of an ailment for, you know, that allowed his, um, his talent. So I think he, he was aware of that contradiction inside himself. He thought he might have been a bit close to madness. I mean, Dr. Johnson as well, always worried that he was, um, you know, on, on, on the sort of precipice. And, and these geniuses, you know, obviously often are. Um, and they're so uh, sort of, you know, driven and focused. I mean, he was incredibly, he was just sort of restless, wasn't he? I mean, so ambitious. Um, and also an actor. So I, I can sort of see that, you know, when, when there's someone who's that ambitious, then everything else is secondary, really, in their life. You know, the work absolutely comes first. Um, and also actors can sort of turn it off and turn it on, can't they? So, you know, they can be amazing in, in public and then uh, uh, once they're back with their family, um, you know, the, the, they stop acting and they're just ordinary people or, you know, or, or you know, quite crappy. Yeah. So, <laughs> Vic, I think we've got some questions, haven't we? We've got loads of questions, so let's move quickly on to them. Um, do we want to have a, a quick uh, a quick comment from Mark? Um... No, I mean, just, yeah, just what you were talking about there, it, it made me think about the role of eros and desire and passion and how maybe you can think of people as sort of close to madness, but I think also the kind of intensity of life um, that you've got to both sort of want great fame to be able to achieve great things want to be close and connected to all sorts of people. But of course that can readily flip um, and be disastrous for those around you or lead you in all sorts of strange, desirous ways as well. So I think this, this quality of Eros came to my mind as well. Yeah, he, 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 it felt like he just, he, it does feel like he was totally prolific. And the fact that he had 10 children and wrote 15 novels, it sort of, it all feels like part of the same thing. He was just sort of, putting himself out there into the world. It's interesting that at the end of his life, he wanted to, um, uh, and well, who knows how sort of uh, honest this was, but he said he wanted to be buried very quietly in a little graveyard near his home in Gads Hill. And they just totally ignored that, put him straight into Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey, made a big deal of his uh, burial. But um, there, yeah, there were moments also when he kind of, yeah, when he wanted to, there was a moment when he moved into Gans Hill when he burned a huge bonfire of all his correspondence. Um, and that feels like an interesting sort of step to take. It feels like that's him saying, this, this is private, this side of my life, and I don't want anyone to know about it. That was at a stage when he was very famous, and I guess he didn't want people picking over it after he died. One comparison I can think of, the only comparison really that comes anywhere close is the Beatles. You know, and um, <laughs> I was just looking at your course, you know, you say that he had, uh, right, right from the early days, there was this sort of Dickens uh, merch, merchandise, like little sort of figures of the, of the characters. Um, and he was just absolutely yeah. massive. Massive. And, you know, you think of the Beatles stepping off the plane to huge screaming crowds. Well, apparently there's a story that when the last instalment of old, the old curiosity shop was coming into the, on the boat, coming into the harbour at New York, there were crowds on the quayside shouting, is little Nell dead? Because they were so <laughs> excited to see the next instalment. Um, so, yeah, it, yeah, it's hard to think of comparisons, really. Yeah, the Beatles, the other person I sometimes think of is uh, Charlie Chaplin, who um, became this, he was kind of reinvent, well, invented so many elements of cinema and became this international figure and um, and has that similar mixture, I think, of humour and sentimentality that Dickens mixes so well. Should we go to your question, Vic? Great. Yes, please. Um, could we start with Melissa? And um, I'm going to read out one in a second, but from Kinjiro, who's 
mic's not working. But Louise Lane, will you line up to ask yours after Melissa and then we'll have, um, let's have Julian after that who emailed earlier with the question. So those are the first and then we'll see where we get to. We've got several more to go through. Louise, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you want me to ask now? Yes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I, I just always find Dickens incredibly filmic. And I sort of have to pinch myself to remember that he lived before the age of film. And I just wondered if you thought he might be a broadcaster or a filmmaker if he was living now. And whether the serialization thing is maybe one of the things that created that, you know, leaving pe the sort of plot construction and leaving people wanting more, but it's so vivid. It absolutely, you're so right, it's incredibly vivid. And there's an interesting essay by Sergei Eisenstein, the Russian film director, about how cinematic Dickens is, the way that he cuts between scenes, uh, the way that he sort of piles montage on, the way that he'll s describe a scene by describing a detail and then almost pan out there's an incredible, um, uh, in Bleak House, uh, which is, I think, my favourite of Dickens's novels, it has two narrators, and one of the narrators is this weird, sort of omniscient, present tense narrator who zooms around like a drone shot, kind of way up above London and then zooming down to tiny little details, and it, he's very, very cinematic. And I think, um, I, you know, I think it's partly because of this knack he had for sketching visually, um, I don't mean I don't mean drawing. I mean he would see a scene, see a person, and in a few words he could describe them with a few just a few dashes of lines, and then you get the picture. You can see it so clearly. So often when you've read a novel by Dickens, you feel like you have seen it. And yeah. I'm sure you're right that that serialization just lends itself so perfectly to those wonderful long uh, BBC adaptations. For yeah. <laughs> I think that. Um, do you know that one? Uh, the quite recent one with Gillian Anderson, the Bleak House adaptation, which yeah. was 30 minute episodes and just, it was a, one of the Andrew Davis <laughs> scripts and just, I thought that was a brilliant adaptation of that novel, it made it so pacey, so exciting. Um, so I totally agree, he's very, very cinematic, I think. It's like that brilliant question slightly um, segues into one from Melissa. Melissa, if you don't mind, I'll just ask it for you. Melissa asks what you thought you think he might be writing if he was a writer today? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a very good question because he, he was very engaged with contemporary politics. He was, he was writing about the things he cared about at the time. Gosh, I mean, I'm sure that, I'm sure he'd have had a field day with Brexit. I'm sure he'd have loved that. I can just imagine the scene round a dinner table with characters, you know, leave us and remain us. And the civil <laughs> service. I mean, you know, oh my that. goodness. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. little, for those who've read Little Dorrit, that's, um, that's this wonderful satire on the process of government. And it, it, there's this government department called the Circumlocution Office, which is just this kind of nightmare of circular bureaucracy that goes nowhere. And um, there was a wonderful uh, Armando Iannucci documentary um, about Dickens recently, where he's, he basically says that book is the wellspring for all the political, all, you know, Yes Minister, the thick of it, all the political comedy that's come after owes a debt to Little Dorrit. So yes, absolutely. I wonder what he'd make of Corona, and I think, I'm sure he'd have been very productive and busy in lockdown. I, it's hard to know. I'm sure he'd have, um, yeah, it, well, very hard to know. I, what I would imagine, what he often seems to have done, apart from David Copperfield, where he runs very, very close to actual autobiography, he, he tends to sort of sublimate his, his personal experience and then sort of little elements of it crop up in different books. So um, I'm sure that a few years after lockdown, he'd have thought, I know, now's the time to write a lockdown, a novel about lockdown. Um, Great, okay. Yeah, fascinating well, to think. We'll Notes move on, on to um, Julian. Julian Fedosiak. Yes, that's it. Hi. Um, <laughs> I just put hi all. Um, just one last question, Henry. I yeah. was I live in the area just down the road from Gads Hill, yeah. and I lived in Bloomsbury for a period of time. But I was always growing up with the mythology and also everything around him, uh, Gads Hill, Rochester High Street. 
and also the history of Chatham as well, the dockyard, yes. which in the 1800s, I'll, I'll send you a link about it, somebody's done it about the history of Medway. It, it, it was quite Dickensian before Dickensian. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether the, the psychogeography that he grew up with in there, because you said he seemed quite happy in Chatham. Mm. But if you read about Chatham at that period, it was quite a den of iniquity and has been until probably the 19, late 70s, early 80s, when the dockyard closed down. Billy Childish sort of thing. Yeah. I'm just wondering, that psychogeography that's created him when he went to London and came back has actually created that psychogeography for, for us all in this North Kent region as well. Because, as I said, he was Dike he's growing up in, in Chatham was Dickensian before Dickensian was Dickensian. Yeah. yeah. Well, fast, yeah, so, so two really interesting thoughts there, I think. So... I think absolutely, I'm sure that landscape and that area must have formed the, the person that he became. And, mm. and it's interesting how often rivers occur in his books. Um, uh, obviously, several of them are set in that area. Great Expectations has a mm. memorable scene with Magma, yeah, Magma, 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 yeah. Marshes. And, and his, the last novel uh, that he was writing, uh, but he died in the middle of writing, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, is all set in a... In a, in a, it's called Cloisterham, but it's very obviously um, mm. a version of Rochester. Mm. Um, so I think he, yeah, absolutely would have returned to that idea of the rivers, the marshes, and, and probably that sense of um, being a bit of an outsider, being sort of near this great metropolis of London, but being in a town just outside of it. Um, and in terms of, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, someone as well known and as prolific as Dickens will have affected the kind of current psychogeography of that area. I mean, I'm sure everyone who lives in Rochester and Chatham is aware of him and his work and... and, and mm, um, a festival every year. Yeah, right, right. And, and until recently, there was that um, kind of theme park, Dickens World in Chatham. Yeah. Wasn't there? I never went. I'm sorry I didn't go before it closed. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. But... Um, well, one, one thing I would like to say is, was anybody actually interested? You could, I have actually done this with a friend of mine. I've walked from Graves, Gravesend along the Thames down to Higham. Mm -hmm. If you go out there one day and you want to get a feel for what's going on in terms of Magwitch and all that, and it, there is a pub out there that, you know, is Dickensian and, it, and it's still to this day, it's right out in the middle of nowhere and there's salubrious characters still in there to this day and it's right, <laughs> out, right by the boats and the the ships it is well worth to get a feel to walk down from gravesend along that river to get a feel what it, it truly is like and what it has become and it hasn't gone at all it, wow. it may be wearing you know sports tops and all that but mm. if you want to get the feel of what it was then and now you'll feel it and if you and if you look out of the side of your eye you may see magwitch running away <laughs> <laughs> brilliant <laughs> what i'll do is i'll post a link about Somebody's put up a website about Medway and its history and the bits and pieces in it. I'll, I'll put it on the chat for everybody. Thanks, but that will yeah. give the feel of some of the historical fervour about it. But the cent that's why I say it's quite interesting because the centre of Chatham, mm. where it has a now defunct shopping centre that was there in the 1970s, was there to clear away the prostitution mm. and all the den of iniquity in central Chatham, mm. where... The dockyard met the dockyard workers plus the Royal Navy, and that was to clear the prostitution away. There's and a, a whole, was, whole scene yeah. there. Yeah. Julian, we're going to move on because I want to fit That's in no a couple problem. more questions, but do post that link. I think everybody would be really yeah. interested. I want to do that walk for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to read out Kinjiro's because her mic's not working, and it slightly links to a question Claudia Bean asked. So I'm just going to to ask you both of these at the same time, Henry. Okay, yeah. Um, Kinjiro writes, did Dickens actually work on education or in education or teaching? His sister was a music teacher in Manchester and he made a beautiful speech about education in Manchester too. Um, so Kinjiro, I think, is asking whether he actually did any teaching. But Claudia being asks sort of maybe separately actually but about his education what mm. was his education mm. great great question so um my understanding i didn't know about the speech that he gave in manchester i must look that up but 
he was absolutely fascinated by education. Schools keep recurring in the books. You think of Do the Boys Hall and, and Nicholas Nickleby. You think of um, uh, Mr. Creakle's school and David Copperfield. Um, schools occur throughout. He was very sort of um, keen. I mean, he was absolutely a passionate supporter of education for all. I don't believe he was. He ever worked in education himself or was a teacher, although he um, did give a lot of public lectures especially on his tour of America, he gave a great sort of series of lectures on current topics. So I guess you could say that that was an element of education, but he was certainly fascinated by it. And I was thinking actually, as I was working on the talks for the Idler, um, how it would be so interesting to take out his school scenes from all the books. There's so many great descriptions of school rooms and it would be, it would be just a lovely little collection to pull together. In terms of his own education, um, it was it was it was checkered. When the family had some money, he was at school, um, and quite a night. You know, enjoyed going to school in Chatham. Once they were in the Marshall C. Debtors Prison, he was not at school. He was working. Um, he really missed it. And uh, there was a moment when his his father finally got out of Debtors Prison when he his mother, the Dickens' his father's mother died, and he inherited some money and managed to get out. And Dickens then did go back to another school, but it was a very, it was, it was a, it was a bullying, um, unpleasant experience. And he actually says that the description of Mr. Creakle's school in David Copperfield is, is a description of the, that awful, I think it was called Wellington Academy or something in London. And um, uh, so that was the extent of his education, really. He didn't go to university. And so he was self-taught. He, um, uh, he, you know, it was part of this kind of huge energy he had, this, this drive. He just absorbed books and, and taught himself as much as he could. Um, but those, those schools that he talked about in Nicholas Nickleby, again, they were a sort of feature of uh, late Georgian or stroke early Victorian England. Yeah, um, and some, in what, Yorkshire. Yeah, and they were all in Yorkshire. And they were, they were sort of basically scams, weren't they? They were sort of, uh, yeah. they, they were confidence tricks. Um, run for the profit of, of the owner and they were profiting out of the desire of parents to get rid of their children. Yes, they're making I, I think, think you said they, they, they didn't have any holidays. Yes, but selling the whole year. Yes. <laughs> like, it's your absolute job. hell. Not see them again. Yeah. Okay, very different sort of question um, from Audley Burnett. Audley, would you ask your question? And then hopefully we'll have time for Joanna. You've got a question. Blimey, that's amazing. I was just tidying up because I'm going to... <laughs> um, I wanted to, to show you, can you see the Dickens? Oh my goodness. You, you, can, you can actually lean on them. <laughs> and, and every single one of these have been read to oblivion by my uncle who was born in 1910, I think, and every other member of the family. Um, probably beforehand. So they're falling apart. Wow. I guess my question was, um, you know, I love Dickens and I'm involved in Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter and stuff. And there's a lot of virtue politics going on, which is kind of really detracting, you know, very, very difficult here and in America and all over the place. Would the question is, do you think, and it's great, great, great talk, by the way, and I'm a grumpy old man, but it's a great talk. Thank you. <laughs> do you think Dickens will survive to be read by young people? Um, I know most young people have, you know, do not read, and there's obvious reasons for that, as much as they did. <clears throat> and do you think we deserve to seriously we, we have a, a duty to seriously challenge Dickens in terms of his, there's some, you know, misogyny there, there's some racism there, there's, um, there's a, a lack of criticalness, which, which now we, we challenge in our intellectuals and artists, or should we just do a sort of a gombrich and say, well, there is no history of art, just artists. Right, Henry, quickly. Big, big topic. So, yeah. <laughs> big topic. Well, you in got brief, a couple of I, sentences. I said, this is something I think about a lot because in my, in my day job, I'm one of the editors at, at the Penguin Classics series. And, um, and something we think about a lot 
is exactly that, when historical authors have views that we that feel very unpalatable today. And it's um, it's it's very tricky. I don't think there's a sort of um, easy answer. Um, I think to sort of I'll just come back to that point in a second. I think Dickens will survive because I think um, I don't think all of them, but I think you know, so half a dozen of his novels are some of the greatest novels ever written in the English language. And I think um, those who love reading will continue to read him. Um, he also works very well at the bite-sized level. So I think if we're, our attention spans all just reduced to nothing, we'll still be able to enjoy him by reading these uh, little segments. But in terms of, um, in terms of that question of, uh, of, you know, how palatable it is now, I think, well, our view is that if, if something is a great work of literature, despite um, those things, then we should continue to read it, we should continue to publish it. But I think we have to acknowledge that times have changed and that maybe what, what's needed is, um, uh, a, you know, for want of a better word, a trigger warning or an introduction that sets the context that kind of explains that there will be some things that might be tricky coming up in this book. Um, and to set some of that sort of cultural and, and social context around it. But um, I, I do have sympathy with people who, who, who struggle with that because I, I don't think it's fair to say, you know, well, it's a different time, so you've just got to be fine with it. I think it's, it's up to what one's self whether you're offended by something. Yeah, and I think the, the, I mean, these issues actually were discussed at the time of Dickens. So when people say, oh, it was a different time, you have to excuse them. You can't actually excuse them because there are lots of examples of, um, I mean, my example is bon Johnson, and Bo Johnson and Boswell. You know, Dr. Johnson was um, fiercely anti-slavery. It was all based on greed and it was just completely inhuman. Whereas Boswell said, um, oh, no, we're, we're civilised with the natives. You know, these are the sorts of arguments that, get, that, that were going around. Um, but... Yeah, uh, can I, get, can I get, just interject there? That's made me think of a question, actually, Henry. You're, you're at Penguin Classics. I mean, that's a brilliant idea to you know, update the introductions um, with, with some, you know, some, some new writers who will address these bits, which are sort of, quotes problematic or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that also makes me think that, you know, you have, I've been looking at quite a lot of the old Penguin Classics, and some of the introductions are pretty dire, <laughs> really boring academic stuff. I don't know when it was done, but they, they definitely need sort of revolutionising introduction-wise. Would you, would you agree with that? You work there. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like painting the fourth bridge. It's a kind of ongoing job. There's something like 2,500 titles on that list. So it's a constant. We're, we're constantly updating, in fact, but some things do get very out of date. It's really interesting looking back at the history of Penguin Classics that at the beginning of the series, well, at the very beginning, there was no English language titles in Penguin Classics at all. It was a totally translation list and then some English got added later. But at the beginning, it was intended to be a list um, with very, very little apparatus around these texts. It was presenting them as, no, you know, almost like a novel, as a kind of you know, presenting the Odyssey as if it was a, a, a paperback you could pick up and read like a novel. And I think there was a move in the kind of late 70s and in the 80s, especially when suddenly they became very academic and these um, very sort of, I agree, quite sort of uh, stodgy introductions got plopped on them. And I feel like, I hope that now we're kind of pulling back a little bit from that. Uh, you know, we're, we're not creating academic editions at Penguin. You know, there's lots of people who do that kind of edition very well. Um, so I think... I think, you know, we are doing that. We are changing the introductions. And for me, the point of an introduction in a book, a book only needs an introduction if a reader um, will encounter hurdles when they come to the text. And that might be a hurdle to do with the language or the context or some of these issues that we're discussing. And in that situation, I think uh, the point of an introduction is to kind of help you over those hurdles so that you can enjoy the text and not get um, interrupted by that stuff. If you want to ask me to write one, um, I'm totally up for it. <laughs> Available. Okay. Uh, this was oh. to, this, some people in the, in the chat room. Okay? Tom's obviously like, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a kind of uh, sideways <laughs> punt for work. Um. <laughs> listen, listen, we have reached the end of the hour, but I just want to give the last question um, to Joanna, who's been waiting. And quickly, while Joanna, you unmute, um, Claudia Bean asked, where does the phrase, what the Dickens come from? <laughs> that come, well, that's older than, um, than Dickens. That, what the, Dickens means what the devil. Dickens was a word, name for the devil. 
Ah. And um, there's actually quite a, Dickens began writing under a pseudonym, uh, which was Boz. And uh, a couple of uh, years after he was sort of revealed that Boz was Dickens, he, um, this little verse appeared in his um, magazine, Bentley's Miscellany, anonymously, but it's almost certainly Dickens who wrote it. Um, and the verse went, um, who the Dickens, um, uh, it, it was a little pun, it was like Hoover Dickens Boz was puzzled many a learned elf until blah 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 and it was revealed that Boz was Dickens self. <laughs> I'm having a little fun with it. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Joanna, your question and Henry, you've got to answer it very, very quickly. Okay. You okay. there, Joanna? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, um, we can. Yes, I, I, I hope you can. I hope you can hear me. I was just wondering if he kept good relationships up with all ten children, or those that survived. I believe he, uh, a couple, died young, didn't they? Yes, some of his children did die young, like uh, Dora and. Um, yeah, well, I can't remember her more, but certainly his daughter Dora died as an infant. Um, he had uh, pretty good relationships with his children. I think. Um, uh, they all they pretty much stayed in touch with him. When he split with his wife, his eldest son, Charles, Charles Jr., Charles Dickens Jr., went and lived with her. So they were estranged for a little bit, but he did come back. And they were all around him when he, um, uh, when, when he died, before he, he didn't actually regain consciousness after his stroke, but they all came. And, and some of them remember very fondly the, the Christmases they'd have with him as an older man um, and the games they'd play around Christmas time. So, um, uh, yeah, he certainly kept in touch. That's another whole thing is Dickens' yeah. uh, influence on the revival of the medieval Christmas, but we'll have to come back to that. At, at well, some I'm other sure point. Henry will come, sure. come to that when he talks about a Christmas carol. I think that's in the third part of the series. Could, could we just mention uh, uh, Victoria Grimaldi before we played the song? Yeah. So, as you know, we try and find an appropriate song to play us out. Um, at the end of our Zoom events, and thanks everyone so much for coming along. It's such it's such good fun to get everyone together, and it's wonderful for us to see people coming in from all over the world, particularly our esteemed friends in um, the United States. And um, we asked Henry, you know, could you suggest some some sort of a song? And Henry said, well, he was uh, Dickens was a big fan of Grimaldi. Grimaldi was the famous clown of the times, and. Uh, you know, and a great singer of comic songs at, at the Victorian pantomime. Now, what's this song called and what, what's it all about, Henry? <laughs> well, Grimaldi had a kind of signature tune which was called Hot Codlins, which has become the kind of national anthem of British clowns. Um, I don't really know what it's about. I think it's about a little old woman who's selling uh, some hot codlins, but I don't really know well, what codlins are. Well, I we like it because... <laughs> well, we, we like don't know what it... We don't know what a codlin is. Is it, a, a kind of, is it like a little fish? Maybe. I, I obviously have no idea. But yeah. what, I, what I like about this song um, is a little uh, bit of trivia. But if anyone's in North London at any point and you're on Pentonville Road, there's a little park there and Joseph Grimaldi's grave is in that park. And you can go there and there's a little installation called An Invitation to Dance on Grimaldi's Grave. And it's a little brass piano on his grave, and the the keys are tuned so that you can stamp on it and play Hot Codlins. <laughs> well, that's uh, incredible. Where, where, where is this? Did you say on, in London? In London on Pentonville Road. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Um, now Fiona Sanderson has said a, a codlin is a pea. Well, that's good to know. I someone, think someone, someone someone else thinks it's a small sour apple. Right. Okay, so um, well, let's listen to the song and see <laughs> what it does. Um, see if it gives us any clues. Okay, it's very short, and um, we'll say after we'll say goodbye. So thank you very much, Henry. Thanks, thank Henry. you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, Tom and me, goodbye till next week. Can't wait to see you next week when we've got Nick Hayes on trespassing, which I think I said was this week, but it's not. It's next week. See you all then. And here's Frank Luther, Hot Codlins. Here comes the little woman selling hot codlins. Hot codlins, hot codlins, hot codlins, hot codlins. 
Oh, there was a little woman, so I've been told, who was not so very young and not so very old. Now they say this little woman, her living got by selling all her cottons hot, 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 hot. hot.